so since uh, since Karen has just joined the panel, we couldn't quite fit her in as a speaker because of the timing. I'd like to ask her first just to make a statement about what you've heard from your perspective before we move on to questions. Right. Well, look, oh, is it on? I think the system of corporate capitalism with lovely working, but um, that economic growth is a basic precondition that yeah, is intrinsic to the thing. No, you sort of said that. But the neoliberal version of the capitalist ideology that, that has been enforced since about, well, through the 70s, by, by about 1980, um, reinforces this fantasy of the whole world population of we're seven and a quarter billion now ascending the stairway to imitative affluence. And um, this, oh, this template necessitates growth of material extraction and production. Now, if Dick's ideas there about, um, about uh, having, a, having a legislative break placed on this type of production were practical, I would just love it. But it seems to me that, uh, and, and this, is, this is also true of, of Herman Daly's a wonderful 10-point plan that he um, published in, um, oh, I don't know, about 1993, 4? I've lost the date. Um, but all those types of things which are about the, the, his, his uh, plan includes all these types of, of uh, breaks on the road thing. Things like uh, ecological tax reform, freeing up the length of the working week, re-regulating international commerce, um, downgrading the IMF and the WTO, uh, like your chances there, stabilising population. All of these things on here are anathema to how capitalism is working at the moment. And so how we even get that degree of um, regulation? We seem to be in a phase of deregulation rather than going the way we need to go. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, questions, please. I'd uh, like to keep them short, so I have one, two, three to start off with, and then I'll call again. Question to Jeff Mosley. I'd like to vision, but would you accept a form of capitalism where the rules of ownership follow the laws of nature, which you can introduce by tax incentives? So if you don't use it, you lose it, and you lose it to the people that need it and create value. So it's what I call ecological ownership to form an ecological capitalism. So sort of, I think it might be a Dick's vision also. No, I'm completely opposed to that idea because if you introduce self-interest uh, through private ownership of things, you also introduce the uh, desire to accumulate more. And uh, in any case, it's unnecessary. Why, why do we have to have private ownership of anything? For instance, um, if, um, if you live in Canberra, you won't own your house or garden. Nobody, nobody does in Canberra. So why does it? It's a lease hostage system. So what's wrong with that? I mean, we don't need private ownership. Yeah. First of all, I don't agree. I think if you own a house in Canberra 99 years, it's equivalent to ownership. Uh, but my suggestion is that you have to be realistic and to start talking about not only stopping growth so we can live in balance, also stopping capitalism. It's just a complete dream world. And so you do it step at a time. And to me, there is a good chance that capitalism can work in balance. It won't do that, by the way, until we have that hit the walking to Parliament, until you have some major catastrophe. But I think to talk about changing capitalism, I know there are a lot of lefties around who'd love to do that. I just think that's not going to happen. And so, but can capitalism live in balance? Of course it can. And by the way, Jeff, you, you mentioned going to this very simple lifestyle. I saw that three weeks ago. I flew my plane up to KPMG and chartered a helicopter in a little village right up in the, not in the Highlands, this was in New Britain. And there were people living there who are basically living the type of cooperative life that you're talking about. And if our system collapses, it won't affect them at all. But I don't think I'd like my kids and grandkids having to live like that. Because it's quite a primitive lifestyle. When you get sick, you die. There's no way of traveling, very limited education. And I just think that's a step back too far. 
Did you want to make a comment, Brown? Yeah. Yeah. I, to me, what's being overlooked is the goal. Uh, I think we're overemphasizing the model of political economy and. Uh, what, what we're really talking about here is the goal. If the goal is economic growth and you have the means for that to happen, you're probably going to get it. And it doesn't matter if it's a capitalist economy or a kingdom. You, know, you still have the same problems that economic growth causes. So, um, and uh, Dick mentioned this uh, Russia or the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, you know, there's a good example. Are we going to try to emulate that. They were hell-bent on growth during the Cold War. Uh, the race was scored in terms of GDP. And so they, you know, pulled out all the stocks for economic growth, just like a so-called capitalist country would. And finally, I just, I want to add that, you know, there's no such thing these days as laissez-faire capitalism. I don't think you would describe any nation as having that. You know, I mean, the the U.S. is, is uh, portrayed as having this very capitalist system, and it all is relative, but I mean it has a constitution. It's a, uh, it's a constitutional political economy, first and foremost. And democracy is, uh, if you have a, uh, a smart enough rider for the capitalist source in your democratic polity, well then you can rein it in and run it at a sustainable speed, but the propensities for, uh, you know, the allocation of, of uh, goods and services in an efficient manner that, that meshes with sustainability, that's more complex. And, you know, that would take another conference, probably. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I'm saying, by the way, is that, that I believe that you can put those controls in. Marx was wrong. He said capitalism would collapse, but he didn't realize huge controls would be put on capitalism. And we capitalists hate controls, but you can put more controls on and we'll still make a dollar, I'll tell you. I just wanted to comment on the uh, situation in the Soviet Union because I was involved with the, with the Cold War, serving in the Royal Air Force at the time. And um, the situation there in the Soviet Union was that the people on the, in the communal farms and so on were disenfranchised by the central form of control that operated there, which similarly operates in China today. Plus, they had an economic growth uh, in set uh, aim of five-year plans. They were engaged in a military struggle with the West, and that was part of the reason for the, for the so-called five-year plans and so on. So it's completely uh, irrelevant to, to compare what a future steady state economy would be like with what it was like under those circumstances of economic growth driven uh, um, socialist. socialism, yeah, um, not, it's not at all relevant. Okay, well we need to move on to the next question, so, yeah, there and then there. Um, <clears throat> Jeff, um, Dick raises an important question about living in simple societies. If you get sick, you die. Now, um, what level of complexity do you envisage, in a, particularly in a post-oil world, for, for, for health care? I mean, uh, are, are women going to have to go back to the bad old days of, you know, <laughs> being in pain while they give birth? What about dentistry? You know, will, will there be complex dental? Uh, what about drugs for, for dentistry as well as... as no, I don't think I've explained our situation very well. Um, the health of the uh, people will be much better for two reasons. One is that they no longer live in the alienation, uh, alienated conditions of huge cities. They have a close relationship with the environment. Secondly, uh, with regard to services, I, perhaps I didn't explain this well enough, but there will be regional hubs which will provide all those services such as uh, education, medical services, governance and so on. Creativity will be much, uh, much more important in, this, uh, in our society, or I should say is much more important in our society. So overall there will be a big improvement in the health of the community. 
Okay, we have a quick question here then over there. So we've got a uh, and then there. Yes. Quickly question for Dick Smith, if I could. Um, Dick, Dick, you've been a successful businessman, and I just want to put on your hat. Um, if you're running a company today, what? How can a company be successful? And listen on the stock exchange, for instance, with the zero population growth in Australia, with a steady state economy, could you have a sustainable company which stayed in business? Um, would it be, oh, without perhaps, would you be able to increase earnings? Would you have to have constant earnings over time? Would you be improving the quality or more services? How does that new business model look for a business? Yeah, look, I, I believe we can still make extra profits all the time because capitalism seems to be able to give this what we call a couple of percent or three percent product, productivity gains. We're so ingenious as human beings using automation and so forth. And so instead of the profit gains coming from more consumer base, which is what helped me and the way we run at the moment, it's a giant Ponzi-like scheme, the extra profits would come from saving money. An example, you're running Woolworths, you can't open any more shops, you don't have any more customers, so you say, let's remove the packaging, the cost of packaging this year. Let's, let's, uh, there's so many efficiency gains, and I've spoken to the top people in Coles and Woolies, and they've said, Dick, you're absolutely right, and this is not the very top, but near the top, you're absolutely right in what you say, we don't even like what we're doing now, we're forced by shareholders, which are the mum and dads, the typical Australians, to have never-ending profit increases, otherwise the shares will be sold, will be given the sack, whereas we know that it's harder that we can get efficiency gains. But they're not going to do that while Aldi is expanding here from Germany and Costco will end up taking them over because those companies in their own right have to grow all the time. The whole thing's a complete madness. Just very quickly, too, I meant to mention was my wife watched on TV last week, you might have seen it. They actually showed on television that in Parramatta, as a positive thing, we're going to have schools in high rises. And they actually said, just like Singapore, and no one mentioned that's going backwards. Yeah. No one linked it to population. And then the other one I mentioned to Hayden Washington is that is that the buses or trains are now going to have 70% standing up. Soon they'll be a hundred percent standing up. And nobody says that's because of the ridiculous population growth. That no one sells it as a disadvantage. I'm just amazed. The house prices, the young people have been listening. When my mum and dad were married in 1950s, they could buy a house, mum stayed home as a housewife, dad was a salesman, they paid off the house with a backyard that I really valued. You can't do that now because we're going backwards and that's because of ridiculous immigration and population growth. Yeah. Uh, yes, my question is to the whole panel. It seems to me that there's a... Uh, uh, there's not been quite as much said as could be about the fact that there's a circularity in the system that we have at the moment. And this is simply that, uh, in a sense, the large corporations or the capitalist interests, if you like, to a great extent either own or greatly influence the governments which are supposedly answerable to the, to the, to the electorate. And they do it in two ways, one directly, either through ways we all know about donations and all that, but also through their ability to influence the, the popular culture. So that much of what people's beliefs and expectations are absolutely determined by the people who are hunting profit margins in large corporations and in the global economy. Now, the question is, how do you break that? There's an inbuilt circularity, self-driving process going on there, which to get a wedge in that process so far has been impossible for the last 30 years at least. Well, um, just there are some simple steps, which I think New South Wales is uh, moving on to, which is uh, banning donation, donations, particularly from developers. I think that's already been banned. Uh, but you can go much further with that, I believe, to break that, uh, those connections. Um, I, I'm, certainly, I recommend that. Yes, it's interesting. Eight out of ten people I talk to I get stopped in the street saying, Dick, we agree with what you say about population and growth. But it's not reflected by virtually any politician except a couple of notable ones, Gordon Thompson's one. And the politicians rarely lead. You know, they follow. And 
I'm just amazed to me that there isn't one politician. I walked down the track with Tony Abbott just before he became Prime Minister and said, why don't you say, look, we all know you can't have potential growth in a final world. Then I said, Tony, you've got to say, hold on, I'm not going to stop growth because if you stop growth too quickly, you'll have recession. But we're going to get the best experts in Australia, even from the University of New South Wales, if there are any, to tell us how we can run our economy without that type of growth that we all know is not sustainable. But he's not even going to say that. I find it fascinating. And that message I gave about the ABC, here's the ABC, it's a group think, where people have sort of a religious zeal that growth is good, never doubt it. So if you can't get the learned people at the ABC who have no profit incentive to come on site, you will never get the business community to come on site. It'll be impossible. And, and I reckon you need that crash. You'll need a, a, a huge economic collapse and then we're really good at fixing things. So if I understand you correctly, you're talking about a sort of an iron triangle that surrounds the macroeconomic policy arena as well as, uh, you know, contributes to the marketing of growth, if you will. That's and that, that is that triangle. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's big money on one side, or you could say the corporate community. That's the, the special interest group in a generic iron triangle. And then you have uh, neoclassical economics, basically, as manifest in the bureaucracy, you know, with your council of economic advisors and your accountants that, that uh, you know, calculate national income. And the, the, the whole neoclassical paradigm that we talked about before is represented by that side of the triangle. And, uh, you know, you have, uh, you have neoclassical econ itself uh, as helping both of these to the bureaucrats and uh, the corporate community to pitch this notion of perpetual growth. So it's a really tough nut to crack. You know, it's like the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned about a long time ago as applied to macroeconomic policy. But so I think there's one thing that's hopeful in this that we have on our side. And it's common sense. You know, once again, I, I, I pitched this, uh, this, this, this mathematical uh, equation that to think there's no limit to growth on a finite landmass is mathematically equivalent to saying you could have a steady state economy on a perpetually diminishing area. It's that ludicrous. It's equally ludicrous. And I think it's easy for us to get over that part because it resonates with common sense. And then, you know, once we establish that, I think also what resonates with people in general, uh, sort of at that balance between the, what the, uh, the tension between, what was it, cooperation and self-interested behavior and stuff, that comes into play in the common sense of people that say, hey, driving a Hummer, that doesn't really fit anymore when the, the reports that are coming out are showing we're 150 percent above capacity driving that hummer building that mcmansion wearing those fur coats or something actually kind of wrong with that behavior at this point in history and that that uh, development of the attitude i'm talking about that's what lowers the propensity to consume which is the number one driving variable in the rate of growth you know basically okay Oh, well, I, I, I would just say I agree quite well with, it, with what you had to say, that, um, that the, um, the fact that 8 out of 10 people really do think growth is crap, yeah. and that, um, I mean, Big Australia <coughs> did not go down well with the ordinary person, leads me further to believe that our whole system is corrupted and controlled by the guys who've got the money. What about the ABC? Oh, they have been wrecked since John Howard, I'd say. They have been. It's, it's more John. Oh, my friend Mike calls it John Howard's ABC. But look, no, but the problem was it was the same for the last five years, and so I just think it's a very important. It you can blame the capitalists, and yes, we capitalists want growth, but I'm fascinated. There's more to it. I think it's resistance to change. It is yes. resistance to change. It's 
it's the ruling ideology, really. That's we need to finish. I just want to get two quick questions, and then we're going to have to finish, and you can continue and after the tea. First is Annie, and then in winning the blue shirt. Can I? I'd like to comment on two things that Dick, Dick Smith said. Uh, one was um, that if Woolworths had to cut prices, they might be remove some packaging. They, they don't. They cut the money that they pay to their producers, mostly the farmers. So I don't think that works. And I'm actually Woolworths shareholder. I don't want my shares to go up there quite. They've gone up a lot already. And the other comment was about the trains. I do believe population is a problem, but that you're talking about the Northwest Rail League. And they're making people stand up because it's a private train and they don't want it to be integrated with the, the other trains. So I think it's not a problem of population in that case. It's because the private industry doesn't want to have those uh, the trains that we have on the rest of our system. And can I have one more thing very quickly? Um, so, uh, it's just about capitalism and, um, and regulation. Um, in, I was at a forum on coal seam gas recently and they were talking about the fact that the government allows us to have long wall mining underneath our water. And a woman stood up from China. She said they don't let them mine under the water catchments in China. So the Chinese company comes here and mines under our water here. Yeah. Comments, please. Yeah, because, look, the, 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 our whole economic system, the success that with our material success has come from unbelievably cheap fossil fuels. If we don't keep using unbelievably cheap fossil fuels, our whole world economic system will collapse. So don't kid yourself. Everyone, there's no one, I've got an electric car out here. Not many people have, and it's powered totally from the sun, not connected to the mains at all. But I know our economic system totally depends on unbelievably cheap fossil fuels. And so it's all very well to kid ourselves. And what I'm amazed about is that all these people against the coal seam gas never link it to that we have to have perpetual growth, which is not sustainable. That's what's driving it. And I get rung up by them to support them. I say, well, I'll support you if you link it to the fact that the poor politician has to have perpetual growth, otherwise we'll vote him out. And so you've got to be linking everything back to the fact that the economic system is driving all this and it's not sustainable. And here's this tiny group here, which are probably believers in that, but I'm amazed. It's something I've been interested in for four or five years, and eight out of ten of most Australians understand it, but the people in influence either don't understand or are not going to mention it. It's very strange. I, and uh, just, just so that that applies also to Australia's coal export, there is no linking of that to economic growth, to its contribution to economic growth, and through that to all the adverse impacts which economic growth have. Right, we've got to go to the last question because then we need to go to our opportunity. Okay, thank you. <coughs> this is a question to the whole panel. Uh, it seems to me that whatever transition scenario we might uh, lock into as being a, a good way to go forward to a sustainable economy is going to amount to significant change to the way we uh, to, to the way we live. People don't like change. I think um, I, I read in the book that Hayden wrote when it was handed out at the desk that maybe we're thinking of going back to the sort of lifestyle sort of affluence we had in the 70s, 1970s, which I would really love. I enjoyed the 70s, that was simple. We didn't have to have nearly as much stuff. Anyhow, if we're going to suggest to people, or to the government, that we need to go down through a transition that will lead us to that sort of uh, reduction in, in lifestyle and change, and expect people to vote for that, or uh, expect the government to do something, I want to ask the panel, do you think our Westminster system of government that we have now is going to be able to respond and make the necessary changes to our policy given that a lot of the community, let's say more than 50 percent, won't want to change? Yes, well, uh, one of the main reasons for change is that if you don't make this change, then you're all going to be worse off. And I think that's the main thing to put. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't believe our Westminster system will do it. I, I just don't think it's going to happen unless there's a catastrophe. And then we'll all do something. But until that happens, and there's quite a lot of growth left. Rupert Burdock wrote to me and said, oh, I don't know whether 100 million is too many for Australia, but deep, there's a lot of growth left. Yeah. And most business people, that's all they're interested in. It's very sad. 
Well, you raised a lot of points in that little question, comment. Uh, people don't like change. I think we need to kind of take it easy on the paradigm shifts a little bit. Don't ask for too much at one time. Uh, so instead of going from you know, economic growth to a quick degrowth and swapping out the political economy for something radically, I think we should take it one step at a time. It's enough to go from growth to a steady state. And we do have, I think, latent political power in that one to follow up on that one uh, or to precipitate that paradigm shift with political leadership. Take talented uh, folks like, like these two guys to my right here and, and probably this lady to my left. You know, they have the leadership potential, I think, to pull this off in a place where your polls show that, you know, what are they, 50, 60 percent of people already basically get it about limits to growth and they want something else. So, and we in the U.S., we look up in a lot of ways to Australia for the examples that have already been made in, in the dialogue like this. So please, take the next step. I'll just say a short thing, um, that uh, someone put up on the board, survival is optional. So I think that's, in a way I agree with Dick that it's going to take, it's going to take the Hitler in Poland or the catastrophic moment 